We're really, really excited about the opportunity to speak to you about how we're managing uh, care to Conus patients in the perioperative setting and the role that our Oculus technology plays, which really is a foundation for how we're assessing our keratoconics. So, <clears throat> these are my financial disclosures. I uh, do uh, speak on behalf of Oculus. Now, um, the, 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 the first thing that we need to understand is that keratoconus is a progressive disorder, right? We can have mild progression, moderate progression, and rapid progression. But the hard part of this is being able to objectively document progression. In the United States, more and more, we are not actually waiting for progression, which actually is an, would be an off-label use of some therapeutics. Believe it or not, the FDA approval for cross-linking is based on progressive keratoconus. And as a result, if we're going to treat on-label, we need to have some objective documentation of progression. So <clears throat> this really is up to the physician's discretion in terms of treatment. So what do we look for? Abnormal increase in astigmatism, a change in visual acuity, slit lamp exam findings often take years and years to manifest themselves. Uh, and, but what we actually observe is patients tell us that they feel that their vision has slipped. And so that subjective feedback is really important. But the use of advanced diagnostic equipment is really kind of a game changer for us. And that's why we're here today, is to be able to look at, kind of get, get a glimpse of the best of class technologies and how we're objectively, objectively assessing not only diagnosis, but progression of keratoconus. And we can do this with shine fluke tomographers, where we can uh, look at the front and back surface of the cornea from an elevation-based standpoint. Um, we can also look at mathematically derived wavefront data on corneal, corneal wavefront that based on uh, coma, this is another way that we really want to pay attention to the, um, another diagnostic finding is the increase in coma over time. Anterior segment OCT is, can be very, very useful, particularly with our high resolution devices. And with the Oculus Pentacam, we now have advanced software that allows us to follow this over time. So we have the Bell and Ambrosio enhanced ectasia display or the, the BAD display that helps us pick up uh, and assess risk factor for the development or progression of keratoconus. The ABCD progression display, which is kind of the next iteration on understanding progression and the Ambrosia Relational Thickness Maximum, or the Art Max, which we have found to be very, very useful in our practice, not only for keratoconics, but also for who's a, who's a good candidate for laser vision correction. So a lot of this is part and parcel. What we don't want to do is create iatrogenic ectasia, and so this really is a broad spectrum of being able to assess patients. Now, what we're most excited about is the Corvus ST and the Corvus Biomechanical Index, which is something that we're looking at more and more to understand the role of this from a biomechanical standpoint. And now we have these references in the peer-reviewed literature that suggest that there is actually maybe a, a, there's a real role of a direct biomechanical index in this. So again, we want to think about shape, all right, and historically, that's what we've always done, right? We've always looked at shape. Now, we also want to look at strength. And we really want to think of these as independent variables. Okay, shape and strength. And, but if we can take the best of both worlds and look at this into a, in a single index, then wow, then maybe we're really on to something. So, recently, in fact, um, the, 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 uh, probably the most important parameter to come out of this technology in our mind is a combined index that takes shape and biomechanics into a single index, known as the TBI index. And this has now been uh, published in the peer-reviewed literature and, in fact, um, was just awarded the Troutman Prize for, uh, for this really important work that, that combines this. I just, myself, voted this as the most important paper and uh, research in this last year, in the year 2017, was this particular paper. So this is really important stuff. 
Now, the, we're, we're, a lot of us are familiar with the Pentacam uh, historically, uh, really a best of class device that is a elevation based, shine flute based uh, tom tomographic imager. And, um, but now we have access to the next generation, not only high resolution, but the AXL. So this also gives us real time biometric data in terms of axial length. And although this lecture is not about the AXL per se, this gives us the expanded utility of streamlining our workup and our, and our throughput and our flow. And we've actually just recently validated this against the more traditional um, optical biometers and have found essentially the same axial length uh, between amongst devices, but we're getting it with a single device at the same time we're getting our tomographic information. Very, very useful. Furthermore, it takes that information and it real time feeds into the our IOL calculations. So again, and then that goes one step further for post refractive calculations, for toric calculations. This is and this is just a growing library of utilities all based off of a single device. So this really is kind of the holy, holy grail, if you will, in terms of how we're going to be assessing our IOL patients and our refractive cataract patients. So here's, a, here's our, a normal eye and looking at the Bellin ABDC keratoconus staging. Looking at the, a, a three millimeter uh, uh, zone, we can look at our thinnest pachymetry. Um, and then if we put in our distance corrected acuity, so if, essentially if we actually take a moment and have our te technical staff input in this information, we can get a, a, a beautiful graph that kind of shows us the keratoconus staging uh, based on uh, uh, Dr. Bellin's um, ABCD criterion. So this shows you, based on a normal scan, that essentially this uh, has across the board ABCD scores of zero, telling us this is likely a normal eye. Well, the best way to study these, this disease state is with something called unilateral keratoconus. And unilateral keratoconus is something that is, uh, is a, is a, um, is a it's a hotly debated topic, if you will. Some people feel that there is no such thing as unilateral keratoconus. Some people f um, feel that this may be something we call form frust keratoconus, pot potentially in the silent eye that has not manifested itself yet, meaning in the ha seemingly normal eye. But it turns out this really is the best way to study these advanced parameters is with a so-called form frust or unilateral keratoconus. So here we see basically a normal eye versus an abnormal eye and, um, and being able to distinguish the, the different parameters uh, amongst, amongst these states. Where this gets really exciting is when we start to use combined biomechanical information. Now we did the validation work in the United States for the Corvus device and just recently published a pure biomechanical index called the DCR index that separates keratoconics from normals in a, in a highly sensitive and specific manner. And so I'd invite you to read our paper in the Journal of Refractive Surgery published last month that describes a pure biomechanical index to separate out normals from keratoconics. <clears throat> so essentially this is a dynamic bidirectional applanation tonometer with a high speed camera uh, that captures corneal deformation, okay? And then with a, a, a number of advanced parameters, we can actually analyze the deformation. So we can look at the deformation amplitudes, we can look at the radius of curvature and the deformation amplitudes based on the, uh, the radius of curvature, um, and a whole host of other, of other parameters. Now, what our paper showed was that if we take the, the most sensitive and specific parameters measurable and then create a regression analysis, a weighted regression analysis to find out what the most important parameters were, put them all into a single equation, which became known as the DCR, we get a very, very powerful readout that all of a sudden is independent of pressure, independent of corneal thickness, and which, and guess what? What's the most important biomechanical parameter of the whole eye? Does anybody know? It's eye pressure. It's the outward deformation force, and a lot of people don't realize that. So when we're looking at these parameters, we, we wanna be able to isolate the impact of eye pressure and just look purely at the corneal biomechanics. So that's where the real opportunity comes in here. And 
Now, where this gets even one level more exciting is when we start to combine that with shape. And again, that was this, uh, based on um, uh, our good friend Renato Ambrosio's work, was able to show and take our biomechanical parameter or just biomechanics and make that even one level more sensitive and specific by combining shape and biomechanics. All of a sudden, this became a research dream and now is bringing this into your clinics in a very reliable way that, and we're, we are having the wonderful opportunity to validate this. And our, this is actually, in a way, becoming our go-to for refractive information, for refractive screening. So we have other progression displays here. And where does that become even more important? Now we have an FDA-approved therapy in the United States for halting progression. And we want to show that we can halt progression with cross-linking, right? So we need the metrics to show that we can halt progression. And we have the software built into the Pentacam now with the Bellin keratoconus progression and cross-linking efficacy display, which can actually show our improvement of stability and in some cases, actually regression. Normally, in refractive terms, we think of regression as a bad thing, but actually that's what we want when we treat keratoconus. We want to have the we want to have the, the steepness regress, okay? We actually want to see some flattening. And we've participated in every FDA clinical trial in cross-linking in the history of the United States over the last decade. And what we found is that almost everybody's progression halts and about half of patients actually regress. So about half of patients improve. So here's a patient of ours looking at Corvus and we've looked at a, a number of these patients now, pre and post cross-linking, and what we're finding is that the stiffest parameters seem to be improving as well. And when you compare uh, pre and post and do an overlay, you can actually see less, less of, a, of a shimmer to the corneal movement, less movement overall, and essentially what appears to be more stiffening just from cross-linking real time, just by looking at the videos. Now, when we look and what can we expect getting back to perioperative care of our, of our keratoconus patients in terms of cross-linking? Well, when we first did these studies, we were alarmed when we saw that our patients were getting worse at a month. So why were our patients getting steeper at a month? Was the cross-linking not working? Were we doing something wrong? So we performed a series of, of, of studies looking at epithelial remodeling and what we found was that this was actually an artifact of epithelial remodeling causing some steepening. But given enough time of corneal remodeling and the eyelid polishing this out, we actually then start to see regression usually around three months. So we always want to show our patients that they're going to may get a little bit worse in a month than they expect it, and then they can get continued improvement for how long? Well, now it's been published for out to five years. Wow. We also tend to see a, a little bit of corneal opacity at a month. And that's an important indicator that you're probably getting some effect. And this is correlated often to what's called a demarcation line that we can see with a slit lamp under the biomicroscope or corneal OCT or confocal microscopy. And so these are essentially are, are activated keratocytes and or um, a loss of keratocytes and this is something that is actually an anticipated, an anticipated finding on the slit lamp that tells you uh, the cross-linking probably worked. Post-operative care, this is similar to care after PRK. Um, we do tend to leave our bandaged contact lens on our cross-linking patients just a little bit longer than PRK. We um, also are more careful to monitor our epithelial healing to make sure we don't get delayed epithelial healing. Uh, and if we find that we feel that the contact lens, if we have a delayed healing, we will actually remove the bandage contact lens because it's often that apposition on the cone that's holding back the healing from the cross-linking. So by removing the bandage contact lens, that last millimeter epithelial defect often can heal itself and that just had to be removed. That was the only issue. So here's our typical post-operative regimen. 
we have uh, topical antibiotics, steroid and NSAIDs in the first day with lubricants. And then what we do is we want to do a, a gradual taper of steroids, uh, typically over a month. Um, we want frequent lubrication that'll help the vision uh, come back. And usually around a month is when we'll start to re-employ our, um, our diagnostic imaging with our Pentacams, and we'll start to look at some of our progression and regression displays with the Pentacam Advanced Software with the, uh, the Bellin um, Keratoconus progression uh, displays. Then we're, now we want to utilize our, our data over time at three month intervals typically, at least three and six, and then we'll probably have them back at 12 and we want to be following di we want to be following our diagnostics over time so that we can get some sense of effect and typically what we're going to find is that this actually worked so let's look at some case examples here's our first case with relatively normal topography and um, and then we can but what's interesting is the CBI is actually abnormal Okay, so our corneal biomechanical index, uh, originally proposed um, by our, 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 our good friend uh, um, Cynthia, has actually, in a seemingly strong eye, normal eye, historically we think strong based on shape, now we have a biomechanical index is saying, hey, wait a second, this may not be normal actually. So it turns out when we start to look a little closer and we see maybe just a little bit of inferior steepening that we might have dismissed as some dryness, then all of a sudden we're thinking, wait a second, this is, this is probably an, an, a subnormal cornea. Well, what about, here's a clearly an asymmetric, irregular astigmatic cornea of two flavors. We have a skewed radial axis and we also have an asymmetric bow tie. So those are the two broad ways that we define irregular astigmatism. And the, not surprisingly, we also have altered biomechanics, therefore loss of shape. So the right eye in this case example I just showed you, this was the fellow eye that shows that probably the left eye that was seemingly normal was form frust, okay? so. We actually call this a uh, prospective, uh, prospective form first uh, keratoconus, meaning probably weak, has not had a chance to manifest itself, it, itself yet, um, and seemingly normal. Well, here's a second case, uh, pre and post cross-linking. Um, we've got uh, the, the pre, you can see clearly, again, radial asymmetry, skewed radial axis. But look at the shape change here on the sagittal, sagittal curvature. Nice normalization of shape. Um, and also, uh, if we look at what I was explaining to you earlier, you can really kind of convince yourself that we've got less movement with a cross-linked cornea relative to the weak cornea with a large deformation when challenged with an air puff. All right, and so that's what this is all about, ladies and gentlemen. I'm trying to strengthen the cornea, which does what? It helps us re retain and hold the shape so that the patient can see well. Here's a, a second case, direct comparison looking at the red was the keratoconus, uh, the blue and then overlay, same after cross-linking. And essentially what you can see is less deformation, less movement in the blue after the same eye that was cross-linked. So the proof is in the pudding. This is real, all right, this is real. And so, <clears throat> what, and, and, and beyond this now, we actually have the ability to look at the biomechanical, these parameters where the stiffness increases, okay? So here's our post-op stiffness parameter, has almost doubled post-cross-linking relative to a stiffness parameter pre. Okay, so again, we have the biomechanics to show this. So the future of refractive screening and progression control really is a hybrid. It's a best of class hybrid of technologies with shape and strength. Shape and strength. And shape plus strength is giving us now a TBI, combined biomechanics and shape index, which we suspect really is gonna be the future of how we're looking at are not only our keratoconus patients, but also our refractive patients for everyday screening. So 
I hope that you would agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that this is a glimpse into the future of what we've always dreamed about. It's research finally making it into the clinic and it's being validated. We've been lucky enough to be part of this validation. Uh, we're doing this work in our Vision Institute, the Wearing Vision Institute as we speak. And we're just really thankful to have the opportunity to speak on behalf of Oculus and get to teach you all today. So thanks for your time and attention. Have a fabulous American Academy of Ophthalmology. Please contact us if you have any questions. Thanks very much.